Hello, everybody. Welcome to the seminar tonight. Uh, my name is Josh. I'm the Community Hub Coordinator here at the church. For those of you guys who haven't heard this, uh, I guess I call it this spiel or rant before, uh, we've been given a government grant over the next year to facilitate uh, basically a, a COVID support center for people that are struggling during the pandemic. Uh, we run free tutoring for kids after school. We do seminars, we do mental health stuff, counseling. Yeah, and so we're really privileged tonight to have two lovely speakers on the topic of grief. And so, as many of us know, this can be a hard time, a challenging year, especially around Christmas time for people that are you know, experiencing grief and loss. And they're gonna talk about tonight how to kind of turn grief into good grief. And so lessons in healing and sharing and journeying through one's own grief and caring for others. So Chaplain Marlette Reed, um, she has provided pastoral care to, to individuals across the lifespan for many years. And she has worked as a community and hospice chaplain. And she works with her twin sister, um, if you guys couldn't tell, uh, and on her research team. And Dr. Annette Lane is a professor at Athabasca, is that right? Athabasca University? Okay. And she's an expert in, I'm going to butcher this word, geron, gerontological, is that right? Nursing. Okay. And yeah, and has published some books. And yeah, you guys will love hearing from them tonight, and they offer a wide variety of experience and stories to share. So yeah, why don't we give them a warm welcome? Um, for tonight, it, the seminar will be about two and a half hours. Uh, there will be a break halfway in between. If you guys have any questions because of the smaller group, you can raise your hand and then you guys are comfortable with that and just ask as we go throughout. Um, do, does everyone have their notes? Did you guys not, anyone not get those? If you need a pen or notes, come see me at the back and we'll get you hooked up with that, okay? So why don't we give a warm welcome to them and we'll get started. Well, this, um, can you hear me? Is this on? This seminar came about in kind of a circuitous way, and that is, is that uh, Annette and I taught uh, a course at Ambrose two weeks ago. It was a week-long intensive. We had a blast with the students there, but I hadn't realized that my uh, Ambrose email was still receiving emails, and so I had a somebody when I went in to do, you know, receive assignments, somebody that I had taught in the 90s in grade seven when I was a junior high teacher, contact me on that email address and James Wheeler from this church did. And so I called them up and said, James, you know, um, you emailed me. I'm almost never on this account. I didn't even realize it was still activated, but I am out there. And if you're interested in a grief presentation, uh, Annette and I would love to do it. So that is how we got here. Um, I will just give you a little bit of information about Annette. She is my much, much older sister. She's a whole seven minutes older than I am. And uh, yeah, <laughs> indeed. And Annette uh, is a nurse by trade and she worked uh, cancer oncology at the Old General before it was imploded and in her 20s. And then she went with CAMA Services, the uh, humanitarian arm of the Christian and Missionary Alliance to uh, Thailand. And she and some others with um, Sean Campbell, who is now the head of Samaritan's Purse, uh, worked in a Cambodian refugee camp. 35,000 refugees in an area one kilometer by one kilometer. And Annette was there for two years. When she came back, um, she got her master's degree and she started teaching and eventually, or fairly quickly after that, did her PhD. But she has done all kinds of crisis work and um, work with, a lot, with seniors and a fair bit of death and dying through the seniors. Uh, line of things. So I get to introduce Marlette. And um, so as Marlette alluded to, she was a junior high school teacher for 18 years at Heritage Christian School. And then she got her master's degree. And she's actually been a counseling pastor at a couple of churches in Calgary um, for some years. Uh, further to that, she did nine years of it was part-time, but it was really full-time palliative care chaplain at Agape Hospice because she'd be on call at night times and be called even at midnight or this sort of thing to come in when someone was dying. 
Um, she still continues working there on a casual basis and does community chaplaincy. Um, further to that, she's a life coach. Um, she's fabulous, really. Um, she's better, I think, than a lot of um, trained counselors. Uh, and that some of that has been through hard knocks. She continues to work with people with death and dying. Uh, she works with me on research projects and writing. Uh, so this is a fun time of life where our careers have intersected and we get to work with each other and uh, we really see that as, as a blessing. We are talking mortality here and so it's hard to believe uh, just by looking at Annette, but she is battling stage four cancer. And uh, this year in 2021, she's only had one clear scan. So um, cancer in her spine, cancer in her sternum, uh, et cetera. But um, she's still going strong and we see that as, as God's grace for sure. Okay, we need to be broken in uh, a little bit humorously. So church bulletin typos. Potluck supper, Sunday at 5 p.m., prayer and medication to follow. We've all been to some of those potlucks. Next Thursday, there will be tryouts for the choir. They need all the help they can get. Scouts are saving aluminum cans, bottles, and other items to be recycled. Proceeds will be used to cripple children. Don't let worry kill you off. Let the church help. The sermon this morning, Jesus walks on water. The sermon tonight, searching for Jesus. And I like this one, low self-esteem group. We'll meet Thursday at 7 p.m. Please use the back door. Okay, so grief is a normal response to loss. Um, sometimes people think, when people are grieving that they should be getting over it quite quickly and we're terrible with this in North American society. We think that people should get over with it quickly and return to normal life and that's just not the case. Grief is a long process. No matter what stage in life, one loss is always many. You know, when you lose someone you love, you say for Marlette and I, both our parents have passed. We realized that we had lost a number of things when our parents passed, but we lost the curator of knowledge about our family. And I know that sounds like not a big loss, but it really was because they were immigrants from the Netherlands. They would tell us some stories when we were growing up and we always appreciated the stories, but we didn't know the questions to ask. When we got older, in our 40s, that's when we had the questions that we really needed answered and they were gone. So one loss is many, you can lose a spouse, you can lose a child, and you lose so many things. We all suffer multiple losses, life losses. We all grieve through the number of losses and the gravity of those losses can vary. I should say we all have multiple losses, but if we do not grieve those losses, in time we can run into trouble. So uh, I was supervising a geriatric mental health unit here in the city, but also working with the adult psychiatry unit. And sometimes we would get women coming in, in their 40s that were in, in trouble because they had lost, when in talking with them, they were very depressed, they had lost people they loved. And if you would ask them, so, you know, how did you grieve? What did you do for yourself? They would say, oh, no, 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 I, I had no time for that. I had to look after my children. I had to look after my spouse. I had to look after this person. And the cumulative effects of loss and grief really caused them huge problems because they did not deal with the multiple losses. And grief is the beginning part of mourning. It is the expression of loss. 
Mourning is the work that is done to adapt to the loss. Marlette is the expert on grief and loss, and she probably can explain that better um, because most of us use those words interchangeably, grief and mourning, and it probably doesn't really matter. But if you ever go to McKinnis and Holloway, uh, Dr. Alan Wolfelt, the grief, grief resource library, he makes this distinction, and I think there's value to it. But um, if you use grief rather than mourning, it doesn't matter. So what kind of losses can we experience? Can people shout out a few ideas? Loss of health. That's a huge thing. And part of what makes that so huge is um, when you lose your health, you can lose capabilities. You can lose a job. But you can, you can go steady for a bit and feel like, OK, I'm adapting. And you suddenly get a drop in health again, and it brings it all up again. And people sometimes lose their self-identity. You know, how they really define themselves is lost when they have a loss of health. It's a good one and a hard one. Any other things? So obviously, we can lose loved ones. If we lose a job we particularly loved, for some people, that can be a massive loss. And it can be actually quite traumatic. Pets are a big thing. You know, um, some people feel closer to their pets than they do to humans because Dogs give us unconditional love. Cats may too. I just don't know because uh, I've never had a cat. But, but dogs certainly do. Any others you're thinking of? Oh, there are all kinds of losses. The loss of a pregnancy in a miscarriage. The loss of a body part due to cancer. Sir? Yeah, yeah. That's, that's huge. And uh, there really is no... Um, there are no competitors when we talk about the hardest loss to have is the loss of a child, even if that child is an adult, because um, it goes against everything we believe about life. One of the things that you're going to see as we move ahead in this presentation tonight is that um, part of moving through a loss with um, a certain degree of uh, stability is because the loss makes sense. But if the loss doesn't make sense, like the loss of a child, then it's that much more difficult. Yeah. So those are some examples. Um, basic info, types of grief. There is anticipatory grief. And uh, this is the grief where you know that a death is going to be coming. And they used to say, hands down, anticipatory grief was uh, resulted in better grief resolution, though they don't actually use the term resolution, but uh, a better process of grief. They don't say that so much anymore. It's more conflicted. But what might be an advantage of knowing that a death is coming? What do you get to do? if you've got a loved one in a hospice. Yeah, and what, what do you do for that? Yeah. Exactly. So you say the things that are really important. You say the I love yous. I'm sorry. Um, there's a reconnection with uh, God, if that is part of one's paradigm, with self and with others. Um, so the only time, because I think anticipatory is, um, is easier, if I can use that term. But the only time where it isn't is if the family has been walking with a loved one for maybe a decade and a half due to serious cancer. And finally, that person passes away. And by that time, the family is absolutely exhausted. And perhaps the resources didn't go into the kids. I, 
I'm thinking of a family that I taught uh, all three children. And the mom, for as long as I had known her, had had metastasized breast cancer. And by the time she passed, um, the kids had been largely raising themselves for a number of years. And the father was beyond consolation. And the family just splintered. And there were no official, you know, uh, I am um, claiming emancipation as a teenager from my father. None of that. But everybody went to their corners. And, uh, and there was no good grief resolution still to this day, even though the loss was over 20 years ago. Normal grief, what comes after this uh, in the next series of slides is normal grief. And it may actually surprise you, but normal grief exhibits physical, emotional, psychological, and spiritual symptoms. So the physical symptoms of normal grief, chest pain, tightness, um, tightness in the throat. Some people say it's almost like somebody's got their hands around your throat, shaking. Um, one precious lady uh, who came into my pastoral care office years ago, she just shook like this. And some people said, well, is it PTSD or is it grief? Well, I think sometimes the two can go together. A long-awaited son, and this son died of SIDS. And this lady believed she was being judged for some choices that she had made previously in her life. And so she just shook like that. Um, exhaustion, lack of energy, grief is all-consuming, appetite disturbances. Some people eat everything in sight and gain 15 pounds. Other people stop eating and lose 15 pounds. Sleep disturbances. Commonly, people say they're exhausted. They fall asleep right away, but then they wake up an hour or two later, and they're awake like this for the rest of the night. Dry mouth, oversensitivity to noise. Um, if this wasn't a grief presentation, and you just looked at the list, what might you think this person was experiencing? Think back to your school days. I think I heard it. Stress. Yeah, you, you know how you have to give a, uh, an oral report in class and then you're really stressed and your chest hurts and all of that kind of stuff? But the physical symptoms need to be checked out medically. Why? Why do we always suggest that people, for whatever grief symptoms they're experiencing, that they get them checked out medically? Could be a heart attack. I remember a case where a, a young man passed away, and, uh, and his mom, just you know, in his dying moments and afterwards clutched her chest with chest pain and it would have been really easy for the staff to say hmm, this is a profound grief reaction but because it's possible that it would be a heart attack EMS was called they checked her out they said hmm, profound grief reaction but you don't want to make a mistake by the way if you have a friend who has uh, experienced a significant loss, even if it's a loss of um, a, a real um, identity-defining career, something like that, it's always wise that your GP knows or that you encourage a friend to let their GP know because uh, grief can throw a lot of things off. Um, even stuff like blood pressure, et cetera, and a family doc can be a very good support. Emotional symptoms, is that you? Oh, yeah. yeah. No, no worries. Um, fear, my world is out of control. That's in particular if uh, it can be if the loss is sudden, if the death of a family member is sudden, or the loss of a job, you didn't see it coming. It's like if this bad happened, 
and particularly when I was doing everything right, then what else is going to happen? You know, we live with this illusion of control, that we can somehow control things that happen in our lives. And, you know, it's a healthy, it's a healthy illusion. However, when all is said and done, we can control some things, but we would be surprised at how little we can control. Crying, that makes sense, although some people don't cry. Generally, it's sort of believed women cry more, men cry less, but that's not always the case. And sometimes that is socially determined. Girls are reared that it's okay to cry. Boys are told big boys don't cry. Emotional numbness, and that can be initially the shock that comes when there's been a major loss or a death is actually a beautiful thing. Because if we were to understand the enormity of the loss all at once, I think it would do some of us in. So we, it's good that we have that numbness. Of course, there's a problem there. Because the widow or the parent of, who's lost a child um, can show up at the funeral and people say, wow, what a rock. And then they go home and think, she's fine. He's fine. Well, no, chances are they're in that numbness, that shock. And that carries them through that day. Not very well, but it carries them. But then in the coming weeks, when the enormity starts to hit, they're understandably in trouble. Anger. Anger at who? Any ideas? Yeah, and it's fascinating, isn't it? Because anger at God, a lot of people feel guilt for that. And I would defer to Chaplain Marlette, but she'll tell people, God's got big shoulders. You can wail at God and say some pretty, would nasty be okay? Yes, I yeah. think. You know, so interestingly, the, the people of faith in the scriptures, um, all said pretty tough stuff to God. Um, Jonah said, I'm so angry I could die. Job said, I wish I'd never been born. Um, Jeremiah said, you deceived me, God. So uh, basically, people can be very angry at God, and I just tell them it's a sign of faith. It's not a lack of faith. It means you're still engaged with God, and you're just rip-snorting mad, and that's OK. He can handle it. Um, depression. Uh, interesting, the DSM-5, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, um, now has in it, not in previous editions, but now has in kind of the depression that can occur with bereavement. But of course, the issue becomes is if that lasts too long, is badly um, inhibiting your life in the sense that you can't go to work or you can't see people, so your your day-to-day -day functioning, or if a person has thoughts of suicide, then it becomes very much an issue. And, and um, I think people in general need help with grieving, not everyone, but most. But when it comes to depression and having thoughts of suicide, that's when we need to get um, professionals involved, family doc or psychiatrist or counselor or whomever. Guilt, this is interesting. I learned this from Marlette, that guilt is a universal. Everybody feels guilt when someone dies that they loved. People think if I feel guilt, obviously I've done something wrong. Something is, is legitimate here that I'm feeling this because I don't always feel guilt. But that's not the case. Do you want to explain? No, it, it is actually false guilt most of the time. Sometimes it is true guilt. And Tina and I were talking um, earlier, and we were talking about, because she's done hospice uh, chaplaincy as well, we were talking about when you can't make certain things right. 
And I remember a case of a gentleman who uh, had been alcoholic and his kids were estranged from him in his dying, which is one of the amazing things about palliative care. You can bring people back together and they can do some of these, say the I'm sorry's, the I love you's, et cetera, which makes a world of difference in bereavement. Anyways, um, there, there was some uh, important messages given. Love you, Dad. Love you, kids. Uh, and he said, I'm sorry. Um, but you know, it, it was the only time that, um, that they came in, the kids. And when I asked him later, and I said, are they coming back? And he said, no, no. And he said, sometimes it's too late. Well, that was some true guilt, some true regret that you can deal with. But so often, when you're helping somebody or you yourself are experiencing grief and loss, um, you do what William Warden calls reality testing. So people say, oh, I just, I didn't tell them I loved them before they died. And if I had known, I would have. And I'll sometimes say, well, um, did they know that you loved them? Oh, yeah. Yeah, you know, we, we say it all the time in my family. Or, you know, we, we don't say the words very often, but absolutely they knew. And I, I tell them, then you've done great. Because love is the most important thing. And so to say then that, uh, that this is a false guilt, it's kind of the truth that sets people free. And not wanting to live anymore, I talked about that. Get help for someone if they're having thoughts of suicide. If you are having thoughts of suicide in a loss, please get help. That's really important. I'll just say this too, it's very common when people have lost a very important person to them to wish that they could be in heaven with their loved one. And, uh, and when people say that to me, I'll just, rather than saying, what? Shame on you. You're not considering suicide, are you? Because that would obviously break relationship. And, um, and they're feeling so badly for a very good reason. But I'll just say something like this. You know, what you've expressed that you want to go and, and be with Fred, Wilma, we'll use our ubiquitous Fred and Wilma this evening. It's very common to want to go and be with Fred. Um, but I'm just wondering, every once in a while, when people say that, they actually are thinking about harming themselves, speeding the process up. Is that something that you've thought about? Well, I, I have I've thought about it. Do you have a plan? Oh, no, I would never do it. It's against my convictions. Or, yes, actually, we have a gun in the house. And depending on the answer that you get, determines what kind of response you provide them with. Yeah. Psychological symptoms include, am I losing my mind? Very common in grief. People feel like, I'm going crazy, because the world they once knew is not the world anymore. Their sense of control is gone. Their sense of normalcy is gone. It's a very different place. And then the love they had for their work may be gone. Now that they've lost a loved one, they may think, this is all meaningless. I can't believe I was so thrilled with my job. Now that you know my sister's gone, this doesn't mean anything to me anymore. So life becomes very strange. Hallucinations of a loved one or dreams. Marlette's got a great example on that one. I'm going to leave it just because we don't have time, I don't think, if I carry that e example on. OK, do you want to just um, quickly say a cultural thing? Oh, yeah. It, it can be a, um, in certain religions and cultures, they believe in a dream that happens. So um, a loved one comes to you in their dream, and they, or in your dream, and they say, I'm fine. I'm doing fine. And it is actually quite reassuring.
for loved ones. And uh, if I may use Brian as an example, his grandfather um, passed away and he wasn't in the province when his grandfather passed away. He never had a chance to say goodbye to him and his grandfather had been very, very important. Well, um, I never met Paul Reed because he was before my time, but it was sometime probably within the first 10 years of our marriage that uh, I woke up to Brian crying. And why was he crying? Well, because his grandpa had, he had dreamt of his grandma, his grandpa, and um, they had a connection and it had been so real and it had just given Brian kind of a, a sense of closure uh, and had been very meaningful. Some people say it's a very spiritual thing. Others say, well, it's purely psychological. And it really doesn't matter to me how you um, classify it. But if we have the idea of, you know, the, here's the church, here's the steeple, open the door and here are all the people. Well, grief is not just like this. It is all of these um, connections that are pulled apart uh, and it takes time to separate. And so whether it is your subconscious that is just bringing these things to mind or whether it is a spiritual experience, it's part and parcel of normal grief. Thank you. Trouble concentrating, that makes sense if it's your loss. The thing that really keeps on coming to the forefront is the loss. If you're working with other people and they're having trouble concentrating, recognize that you may need to repeat things or you may have told them something and then three days later when you say something and it doesn't jog or trigger their, their memory, just realize that trouble concentrating is real. Trouble making decisions. Um, yeah, because your whole life is upside down. And we generally say for at least a year, don't make major decisions. Don't move out of the, your current home. Um, don't move you know, across the country. Don't get married to someone else. We've seen that happen, where what drew people together, uh, a man and a woman, was they both had lost their spouses. And it seemed to be OK. But at one point, they kind of woke up and looked at each other and kind of thought, who are you? Well, it's because what really drew them together was the grief and loss. And now that the grief and loss had been processed, then they had this mate that they might not have chosen had not it been for the grief and loss. Which is why in grief share groups, they don't want you um, pairing up right away, you know, and, and they make that explicit, do they not? I think so. So grief is very spiritual. Um, spiritual meaning broadly spiritual. Why me? What is the meaning to life? Where is God in all of this? What happens when we die? How does the world go on after this person has passed away? Life's bigger questions, which are often not asked in the day-to-day, -day, get asked at this time. So um, I think I said to Tina, in the years that I've done hospice chaplaincy, I think I've known three atheists um, who pass being atheists. Because so often what happens is people start to think about the next life because it's right here, right in front of their face. Um, in the regular day-to-day, -day, it isn't. But when they're facing loss, either of their own life or somebody else's, then uh, it's very pressing. Behaviors of grieving people, searching, calling out. People will call out for a dog or a person when they enter the home and, and say, Fido, where are you? Or, you know, Betty or Wilma or Fred, where are you? Um, because home doesn't feel like home without the person. Sighing. Sighing occurs some when we're really tired or really overwhelmed. Well, when we lose someone close to us, we're tired and we're overwhelmed. Restless overactivity. 
some people, instead of sitting there and crying, they um, tear up the deck and rebuild another deck. And so, again, this is kind of gender um, typing, but the notion of men tend to work off their stress around grief while women tend to speak it out and cry, um, that may be not the case as much anymore when we have more crossover in who does what in terms of gender roles. However, the real crux here is, is that if one member of a couple is doing something like the overactivity, so let's say the woman keeps on cleaning the house over and over and over again, and the floor over and over and over again, and the spouse says, stop it, stop it, I can't stand it. You know, it's, it's trying to help them understand the rhythms of how they deal with their grief and what they need from each other. And if they can't get everything that they need from each other, because they probably can't, who else can they go to as a couple and as individuals to get those needs met? Visiting places or carrying around objects that remind the survivor of the deceased or avoiding all remembrances of the deceased. So we had a cousin who committed suicide when uh, I think we were about 25 and she was 23. And um, I was in Regina for that um, few months at, at seminary and Marlette um, would meet with my cousin her sister every Monday. She was always carrying letters and objects of her cousin to talk about it. And then those that avoid all remembrances of the deceased, our aunt and uncle. Our aunt wanted to put a picture of our cousin in every room of the house. My uncle wanted none of them, none of them in the house. And so they agreed on one picture of our cousin in the living room. But it was a large one, yeah. <laughs> Treasuring objects that belong to the deceased, boy, that makes sense. Our mother had said to us as she was getting older, would you girls like my jewelry when I pass? And you know, we did the obligatory, oh yes, mom, yes. We didn't like her, jewel her jewelry. You know, she, we were far more conservative than our mother was. I don't know how that happened, but we were. Neither did she. She, Neither didn't, did she. she didn't know why we turned out the way we did. Indeed. But you know, as soon as she died, we were divvying up the rings and we put them on because it meant so much now that she was gone. We went to her funeral with, with uh, some of her rings on. Absent-minded behaviors make sense. If our thoughts are on the, the person who's passed, of course we're going to be absent-minded. So forms of unresolved grief, and again, if you look here, Rando 1984, this book, it, it's in the recommended list. It's about this thick, 600 pages. I don't think there's a picture in the book. It's everything you could possibly want to know about grief. But it does reflect the time. So unresolved um, losses or grief, she talks about. And uh, today we would use some different terminology. But you'll get the picture. Absent grief, often with socially negated losses. What are, um, give me an example of a socially negated loss. Where society doesn't recognize it. A miscarriage, yes, very much so. What do people say? If you've miscarried, they say, oh, sure, you got pregnant once, you can just have another. Another one? When someone would lose their, uh, their partner, um, same-sex partner due to AIDS, and you'd see something in the paper, but they couldn't say, um, Bob and, and John were, were partners for X number of years and each other's best friends. It was a socially negated loss. And I cannot imagine being the partner of a person who died and you can't even get your name in, in an obituary. How difficult that would be. 
I've got one from the Marlette case files. Just a lovely lady that um, I was asked to provide some bereavement care for. And I said, yep, I'm happy to do that. Well, it turned out the person that she lost was her lover. And um, this man was married. He never, ever planned on leaving his wife. And she never expected it. However, she was, um, she had a high emotional IQ. She was emotionally intelligent. She knew she couldn't go to the service. So in our grief sessions, or our bereavement sessions, I said, well, you, you didn't go to the service. Is there something that you need right now? Is there some way that you could honor your loved one without, um, you know, upsetting the apple cart uh, with calling up family members, et cetera, and identifying herself as the mistress. And she said, yes, actually, uh, both, uh, I'll call him Fred, both Fred and I are very much into the environment. And so sometimes on our city walks, our urban hikes, we would pick up garbage. So she said, I would really appreciate it if you would join me for um, some time of picking garbage along the Bow River. Well, it was, I do not so much during COVID, but in the past, I've done a lot of funeral services. This was a modified one, and it was the strangest one ever. So um, I didn't have any of those nifty little latex gloves from the hospitals, so I had uh, dish gloves, and we each had a uh, plastic bag. It was pouring rain, and we were walking through the big bulrushes along the river, picking garbage, and then we went into a Starbucks and talked, where she could talk about her loss and what it meant to remember this gentleman. Was I condoning her um, behavior in terms of her relationship with this man? No, but that wasn't the point. The point was to provide her with bereavement care for a loss that was super real to her. And so it was a very unusual funeral ritual. Oh, okay, so we're, that's absent grief where people are not allowed to grieve. Inhibited grief is grief expressed in a limited way with somatic symptoms popping up later. So if, um, say, in your family, um, tears are not allowed. So everybody had to be really strong at the funeral and you didn't cry. But then six months later, two years later, you're having a lot of stomach aches. And a wise GP might say, okay, when did these stomach aches start? And was there something that you, know, um, you could tie it to, et cetera? It's a somatic or a physical symptom pops up because of an emotional loss. Delayed grief, sometimes due to pressing responsibilities. Um, if there's been a terrible accident and uh, one child has been killed and another child is still alive, but they're just barely hanging on to life, all the energies rightly go into the child that's alive. But sometimes that delay um, can result in not actually following through with the mourning. And conflicted grief, an exaggerated expression of one manifestation of normal grief, the suppression of others. Here, this is often in situations where somebody, say, for instance, um, your mom was Mother Teresa as far as all of the city of Calgary was concerned. But behind closed doors, she was a quite something else. And... Uh, you cannot at the funeral say to everybody, oh, well, if you only really knew my mom, or you can't put it in an open letter to the Calgary Herald saying, you know, Mother Teresa, not exactly Mother Teresa. No. So what you end up doing then is you only grieve the part that everybody says, oh, your mom was so kind. 
your mom was this, your mom was that, but the other piece of it remains ungrieved. Where, per, say, mom beat the children. Something, it's a hypothetical example. I always tell people you grieve the good and the bad because it all registers on your soul. And so um, you grieve good. I, I won't have my mom's um, special meat pie ever again. But you also grieve what wasn't good. And you say, oh, I, I don't know what it would have been like if mom had been what she was in public at home. I didn't have the mom that everybody thought I did. And you tell it to a grief counselor, you tell it to a pastor, you tell it to somebody close to you. So you bring some congruity between um, the public and the private uh, person who passed away. Um, just moving on, chronic grief. The mourner continues to exhibit signs of intense grief long after such expressions would be considered normal. Queen Victoria was in mourning garb for the rest of her life after uh, her husband, whose name just escapes me, Albert, passed away. Um, unanticipated grief, adaptive capacities are compromised when a significant loss comes out of the blue, and then ambiguous loss, and I'm going to let you talk about that, kiddo. Sure. Well, uh, Pauline Boss came up with the concept about the missing in action vets in the Vietnam War. And she talked about how family members back in the US knew that probably their loved one was, was gone. But they couldn't grieve the loss because the person was physically absent, yes, but psychologically very present. And until they saw a dead body of the their son or daughter, most likely their son, they couldn't grieve the loss. Interesting, she flipped that concept around in the late 80s, early 90s, about people with dementia, when they have a loved one with dementia, Alzheimer's being the most common form of dementia. And she said, their loss is very different. And what it is, is that the person is physically present, they probably look a fair bit the same, psychologically they're absent. This is not the man I married, or this is not my father, or this is not my mother. And the losses they feel around that are huge. So the term ambiguous loss is very much there. And they may, people may even say, well, your dad's still alive, or your mom's still alive. What are you grieving about? Well, people grieve as, as they see their loved one sort of disappear from their eyes step by step by step where like our father didn't know our names and had in his filing cabinet my children's names are with their names and even when we said hi dad he didn't understand that dad meant he was a father and if he was a father then we must be his children and you grieve when those things happen so I'm going to move on. I've talked about gender responses in grief already, but I just want to briefly touch on something in re regards to delayed grief. Um, I worked on a crisis team, and it was largely with teenagers, which I've never been good with teenagers. Don't understand them. That's why my husband and I, we got married, and we had basset hounds. Um, so. <laughs> Anyways, um, this was an interesting situation. The, the, the son who would not come into the session with his mother, um, and I was called to come because the son was being terrible to the mother, you know, um, coming home late, this sort of thing. But he sat in a side room and listened from the side of the bed. And he was, so he was listening. So we got talking, and I said, well, how long has this behavior been? Oh, she said, I know. It's been since um, my son found his grandfather. 
and he had had a heart attack. And this dear fellow tried to resuscitate his grandfather, but his grandfather died. And she said he was the one close male figure he had in his life. So I said, how much of this is the fact that your son's not bad? He's not bad at all. He's just profoundly sad. And she said, well, I think that's it. She had never made the connection that his sort of nasty um, behavior was all about unprocessed, unresolved grief. And so then we talked about, because it was coming up to the one year anniversary date, and anniversary dates are so important when we've lost someone that we were really close to. So we talked about, is there some sort of ritual the mom and the son could do to say, you know, goodbye to grandfather because he had never gone to the funeral and funerals are important. They're much more for the living than the dead. But also hello to a new life. And so when it came to a follow-up visit, I wasn't working that day, a colleague did the follow-up visit, but he was significantly better. So sometimes grief, if we either cannot express it ourselves or we're not allowed to express it, it can come out in difficult ways. Is that me? Okay, so children deal with grief in bite-sized pieces. Gender responses to grief. Oh, I covered that. Okay. Yeah, okay. So uh, children deal with grief in bite-sized pieces. They cry and then go play, for example. So we had a Hindu family at hospice, and uh, this was a, a, quite a young father who was passing of a brain tumor. And uh, often when somebody is um, actively dying and no family is there, a phone call can be made saying, please come quickly, or you may wish to come quickly because your loved one is close to passing. But when the staff realized that this gentleman had really taken a turn for the worse, the family was already on the way. The daughter was in grade five, the son was about five years old. And so basically, um, the family, the, the wife and mother, and the two kids came in the doorway and some staff met them there, and I drew the little boy off to allow the mom to go upstairs because the little boy, and you can often let children tell you how much they want to know, he said, I'm thirsty, I want some juice. So I took him to where uh, the cafeteria is and got him some juice, and then he was in this beautiful Superman costume, and, um, and he had a, uh, one of those little helicopters where you pull a thing out of the bottom and it flies off. And so he was doing a couple of things. He was jumping off of an ottoman in the uh, seating area, crying out, I'm Superman, my dad needs my healing energy. And then he'd say, he's dead, isn't he, to me. And I'd say, when you're ready, we'll go up, buddy. Um, I felt that was a better uh, news to come from his mom. And so he played with these various things. And by the time he said, I'm ready, remember, he's five years old, he took my hand. And I found his other shoe, because of course they fall off. And we went upstairs, and his mom met him at the door. And uh, you know the rest was history. But at the funeral, this was uh, an Indian family. And he was dressed up in the most beautiful of outfits, um, kind of a Nehru jacket and uh, with the, uh, the cultural slacks, et cetera. And he was running around high-fiving people. And people were giving him money and candy. So he was going around high-fiving, et cetera. Well, um, at a certain point in the funeral then, because we are in Canada and not in India, we don't have the funeral 
papyrus that get, you know, just kind of pushed out into the Ganges or whatever, certain, well, I, probably all of them, crematoriums in town, they are prepared for this. It is the youngest, the oldest son's responsibility to light the funeral pyre. Because there are no funeral pyres in Canada, then um, there's a little ceremony that happens at the oven, and the child or the son presses the button. And so um, he went and he did his job. The priest had explained it to him. Then he came back upstairs with the men, because the women didn't go downstairs for that. And then after the service was done, again, the high fives, etc. Well, nobody said, oh, my son, you don't understand the gravity of this situation or how inappropriate. Nothing. No, it's how children deal with grief. And you know, sometimes as adults, sometimes we have to do sort of the same. Whether it is we, uh, we've lost something or somebody close to us and we have cried and we have taken care of some arrangements, but then we just need to go to our hot yoga class or we just need to sit in a movie theater, even if we don't pick up on a lot of the movie, but we just need to be somehow uh, take ourselves out of that and move ourselves over. Now I say that understanding that there are certain types of grief where there's just no way to do that. And, uh, and certainly the loss of a child would be one of those circumstances. Um, yes, go ahead. So a very egocentric view of the world for a child may feel that she caused a death. And sometimes that happens for children if they have been upset with their sibling, they may have said, oh, I wish you would just die. And then some tragedy happens and the child dies and they feel guilty, which is a horrible thing because, of course, they didn't cause the death and they can carry that for some time. And so it's that egocentric view, kind of like the world revolves around me and what I'm feeling and thinking and the need to help children with that if they express that it was their fault. They can enter into a depression that manifests as rebellion. And the example I gave was, was a good example of that with the teenage fellow. In North America, we're death denying. Isn't that the truth? We get, depending on where you work, three or five days off that is paid. And if you take any more, you either have to use vacation days or you're not paid. Um, and you're expected to be thrown right back into things in terms of your work and whatnot. We are very death-denying, and we're uncomfortable with out outward expressions of grief uh, in the community. So if someone starts to wail, people don't know what to do. Meanwhile, in other cultures, public wailers can be hired for um, a situation, like for a, a service, and then the mourners are walking along a street. There can be public wailers that scream and yell and wail. Um, we're not that way. We expect that people behave in a certain fashion, and it's really unfair. What, by the way, would be the rationale to have some professional mourners there? What what service might they provide? They give permission for people to be very demonstrative in their grief. You know, none of us likes to make a scene, but if there are already people making a scene, then we feel more comfortable. Okay, I think so. Shall we take maybe five, five, six, seven minutes, just a washroom break, and then we'll just keep on going? Yeah, there, there are some books uh, Annette and I have done, and uh, um, we do not have a, a credit card machine or anything like that. If you're interested in that, um, you can grab one of my business cards and take whatever home you want, and we'll trust you 
to get back to us uh, with an e-transfer or something like that sent to my email address. Thanks. Tina mentioned to me in the break uh, about how grief can uh, impact others in the family. And, uh, and so in one case that she knows of, uh, a person in the family did not uh, take his antidepressants that he had been given. He wasn't going to, um, to really work on things, uh, but it was having a real impact on him and his relationships in the family. And I said to Tina, do you think it might be that something to do with the fact that if he moves through his grief, then he has to let go of that person? And you know, that happens a lot. Now, in grief, we recognize now that there is a relationship that remains. So our folks are at Queen's Park Cemetery. And if I do a funeral at the, um, the place there that's in Queen's Park, Calgary Crematorium, I swing by my folks' grave and I just talk to them. Say, hi, mom and dad, uh, just me, doing fine. You know, how are you? <laughs> so I just, um, there is a relationship that continues. But sometimes people think, hey, if I, if I help myself in this way, I could end up then forgetting their voice. I could um, maybe, maybe I'm being um, disloyal to them, that I'm not remembering them. And if you're attuned to some of those things, you can ask questions like that to say, are, are you afraid then that you, you might forget what their voice sounds like? or whatever, and just assure them that some kind of a relationship continues. Uh, um, there are special situations in grief. Uh, suicide is uh, particularly difficult. You know, I've done funerals um, for oh, about a half dozen people who have committed suicide. And um, sometimes the family wants it addressed head on. And those are easier to do than the ones where it's kind of known, but nobody says it. And in one service I went or uh, that I led, um, the young woman who passed away was a party girl. And uh, those were her parents' terms. And a good part of the group that came to the funeral were drunk. And they giggled in the service and they were inappropriate. Well, they weren't trying to be, but there was this unspoken thing that happened and everybody kind of knew it but didn't have it confirmed and it was so awkward and it was awkward on everybody. But the parents did not want it identified as suicide, so I didn't. But if, if they will allow me to, then I will address something like that head on. Um, in the past, when suicide was completely taboo, of course, then it was very difficult. And you couldn't have your loved one buried in the churchyard. So um, the whole community knew that if, it, if your loved one wasn't buried in the churchyard, well, then there was a suicide involved. Um, made medical assistance in dying. This one is difficult. Um, and I'm going to, uh, however you work through this morally in your own mind, I am just going to address it tonight from a bereavement perspective. That in the people that I've worked with who have lost loved ones to MAID, um, they, the loved ones, or the, the remaining people experience it as a suicide. Some people use medical assistance in dying in ways that it was never intended. So I started to tell Tina this story, but it happened in another province, uh, another province that has the ocean. Could be east, could be west, I won't even say. However, um, a lady with cancer. Now, she had stage four cancer, but remember, so does Annette. And um, a friend of mine, was asked to witness the documentation. 
And so she did. She went out there and she witnessed it. She wasn't certain whether she would be invited to be present when this person received medical assistance in dying. So she hung around. Um, she did know that she'd be invited to the party the night before. And this party was a lingerie party. And the question, all the, the girlfriends were to bring lingerie and the nicest lingerie she would die in the next day. So um, the evening, everybody brought their lingerie, et cetera. The next day, she gets up and she's got some time before the medical people come. So she goes outside to um, check the mail. And the neighbor is walking by and she says, hi, hi. Um, and he says, hi, hi. And she said, I'm dying today at 1130. And when it sunk in, the guy just collapsed, sobbing. This woman, what precipitated her choosing to die at this point was a fight with her brother via email. And she didn't tell her siblings, and it's not required by law, she didn't tell her siblings what she was going to do. Um, but she had left arrangements for flowers and a note to be sent to each of her siblings after she was dead. And the note would say, hi, I'm gone now, but um, it's been a slice. Anyways, uh, my friend, and I was helping her debrief this, I said, you know, was she really, really ill? Because in my heart I was thinking, this is sounding a bit manipulative. My friend maybe could be present, maybe not. Um, oh, she can come to the lingerie party, but not the next day. All of this stuff. And so I said to my, my friend, you know, um, was she like so close and in such bad shape? And my friend said, well, here, I'll show you a picture. So she pulled up a picture on her phone, and here was this really attractive lady sitting on a rock in a bay in the ocean in a beautiful outfit. And I said, was this taken like, you know, a couple of years before her death? Oh, no, two days. I took it two days before she passed. Well, when all was said and done, um, it, was, it was kind of payback for her siblings. Now, she did have cancer, so I won't say that she didn't have that, but um, it was used in a way it was never intended to. And I find that so often um, loved ones experience the grief of one who has died by medical assistance in dying as a suicide, which, by the way, is what they used to call it, physician-assisted suicide. Crime, um, this is really hard. Uh, you know, it's a special situation in grief, but if your loved one was mugged downtown and killed, um, there's a sense of untimeliness. It doesn't make sense. It's very, very hard. Unanticipated accidents, especially unusual accidents. Illnesses where the symptoms have been isolating or taboo. Uh, one time we had a, a gentleman passing of Jakob Kreutzfeldt disease. Kreutzfeldt Jakob, right. And uh, it is like mad cow disease in humans. And the man's adult son sat outside the room on the floor as his dad was dying in the hospice room. Well, the father could not talk or communicate. He lay there like somebody with a, a dementia in the last stages. And his son was obviously suffering great distress. So I just sat on the floor with him. <laughs> And, and we talked, and we talked, and this son said, if my dad had cancer, the room would be filled with friends and family members, but he's got mad cow disease. And people think, I might catch it. 
and they're not here. They're not providing support. Special circumstance. Okay, so what are some commonalities between these types of loss? I'll just go on to the next slide because Marlette um, had touched on it a bit. Untimely, senseless, and unshareable. So Marlette kind of mentioned that. Untimely, it shouldn't have happened, and of course, that's a big issue when a child dies, even if the child is an adult. It is untimely. The natural order of things is people get older and they pass. And when that doesn't happen, everything we know about this world doesn't make sense. Senseless, you know, if someone is walking under some scaffolding and something happened to drop and it kills the person, it's like if my um, loved one had been 30 seconds before or after, this would have never happened. And how do you make sense of that? Uh, because we all need to make sense of our losses. Um, in, Can you tell um, the group what Lorraine yes. uh, Wright or Lorraine Watson says? Yeah, Lorraine Wright, um, uh, she uh, was a professor at the University of Calgary. And in my master's degree, I learned how to do family interviewing and counseling. And um, she talked about when people are going through grief, they often say, if, if I only knew the reason why, if I only knew the reason why. And her question was, what if you never get the answer to why? What then? Because sometimes we don't get the answer to why. Then we have to say is, what then? What do I do next? Now, some people say if they've had a, a son or a daughter who, who died to a drug overdose, um, what do they do? They become um, drug counselors. Now, that's not a bad idea. The one piece of counsel I would have for that is to wait till there's been a bit of healing here. None of us are ever totally healed. You know, there's a reason why Henry Nouwen wrote the book, The Wounded Healer. So none of us are ever completely healed. We all have triggers. We all have things that are difficult. But at least that we've gotten a little bit of distance. Say, if a, if a daughter died of drug overdose or, or died of, um, had been in, in uh, sexually exploited in terms of prostitution, um, do we go down and volunteer? That may be a terrific idea, but wait a bit. Wait a bit until you've had a time, a bit of a time to heal because the, the senselessness of the death, the untimeliness, and, and the unshareable quality. Now, for some people, it's not unshareable. They can say, this is what happened to my loved one. For others, it is. And, and it may be shareable in one community, but it's not shareable in another. Certainly, if we are trying to help people, one of the things we do is that we'll say, you know what, this shouldn't have happened. And this was untimely. We all believe that we'll get to be a certain age, and then maybe we'll pass, but not earlier. And, and you know, address this must be horribly difficult. Like, how do you make sense of this? That's a good question. If it's unshareable, be the ears that will listen and listen and listen and say far less than um, what you actually listen to. And, and we need to be careful about platitudes, whether they come out of faith whether they come out of just sort of general beliefs about the world being good or you'll get over it, that sort of a thing. You were going to say something. Oh, I'm just going to move on to the tasks of mourning. So William Warden, he has his own um, tasks of mourning, which I quite like because they're a little less passive than Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's stages of grief. So. Um, there are four tasks. The first one is to accept the reality of the loss. To not complete this is to deny. 
And that sounds a little bit far-fetched that somebody would deny that their loved one has passed away, but it can be more subtle. Our grandmother was 15 years younger than our grandpa. Now, we never met either of them. They were gone long before we were born. But um, Oma, after her husband passed away, would sit at the back door and wait for Papa to come in and, um, you know, sit down at the table and say, what's for dinner? Well, on some level, she never really accepted the death. By the way, she died within two years of her husband's death, even though she was much, much younger. Uh, task two, to work through to the pain of grief. To not complete this is to not feel. So a person who is entirely numb through a whole lot of stuff, um, that's not a good thing. And some people are more emotional than others, but there has to be some degree to which one feels the loss if it's a significant one. Um, if, well, let me tell you this, uh, was, a tr was a tragedy. We had two angelfish in our home. And uh, they were Brian's project. And he named one Annette, and he named one Marlette. And they were in a bookshelf in a tank. And, you know, at one point he said to me, I'm, I'm so sorry, um, we lost one of the fish. And, uh, and so I said, oh, well, you know, whatever. And because it was like I, I don't even like fish in batter, let alone angelfish and tropical fish. Well, Brian was kind of relieved because he then when... I was obviously not grieving. He said to me, actually, Marlette, it was, it was Marlette who died. Um, and I flushed her down the toilet and renamed Annette Marlette so that you wouldn't feel like I flushed you down the toilet. <laughs> so, yeah. But that was, that was not a case of me refusing to feel the loss. It's just that I didn't care. So there are losses like that. If, you, if you're um, a friend has a great aunt, uh, Wilma, from England, and they've never met them, and they pass away, um, it's not necessarily appropriate to say, well, you're not crying, therefore you're not completing task number two. Well, it is really insufficient attachment, which is not a moral... Um, you know, declaration over somebody. It's just saying there isn't much of a relationship. So we can't mourn seriously over every single thing that happens in this world, right? Um, task three, to adjust to an environment in which the deceased is missing. To not complete this task is to not adapt to the loss. There was just a beautiful gentleman who passed at Agape, and his family was delightful. And uh, this was a second marriage, and she was from the East Coast. And she said to me, as soon as he passes, I'm going back to where my family is. And I, I said to her, you know, I, I kind of get it, why you would want to be back there. But, you know, uh, from a grief perspective, it's probably good to hang around Calgary for a while and just, you know, get used to not having um, your, your Fred, right, Fred here. And, uh, and so when all is said and done, I didn't know what had happened to her, but I ran into her son and daughter-in-law in Market Mall. And I said, how is mom doing? She's doing terribly. Well, what has happened? Well, the minute dad passed, she went back east, and she's not coping at all. Well, part of it is, is that she never got adjusted to the environment in which the deceased is missing. So on one level, she knows her husband is gone, but on another level, she feels like she's on vacation. The fourth one is to emotionally relocate the deceased and move on with life. To not complete this task is to not love new people who come into one's life. Um, if you have a concept of an afterlife, that's where people generally 
relocate their loved ones. Or um, they are in Queen's Park. Or I know of one case, and um, this is actually not uncommon at all, where a woman was so close to her 95-year-old mom, and uh, we all thought that she would do very well in her grief because she had worked as a health care aide in a nursing home for many, many years. Well, she was just petrified of when her mom would go. And how was she going to cope? And how would she keep mom close? She was not a religious person. So we kind of talked about getting a locket that she could put a few of her mom's ashes, cremains, they call them, in there that mom could always be right here against her heart. Now, will she always need to carry some cremains of her mom around? Not likely, but for the time being, it's important. So we need to emotionally relocate the, the um, loved one. And a grief counselor works to help a client through whatever task at which he or she is stuck. So um, if, if they have not felt um, the loss Number two, task two, you ask them some questions. Describe, tell me, you know, where were you when you got the phone call? Um, what did you do as a family? Then when you heard, did everybody come over to the house? You know, you do stuff to not be sadistic, but rather to evoke emotion, to help that person feel, that kind of thing. Okay, lessons in healing. Be good to yourself, give yourself time. Well, that sounds like a dumb thing. It sounds like uh, what should be just common knowledge and what we should all automatically do, but most of us don't. And we don't do that because society in general keeps on moving on at a very quick pace. And our friends and family, maybe not family, but friends expect us to go ahead quite quickly and so we don't give ourselves time to grieve and, and to forgive ourselves when things aren't done, uh, when we're not performing the way we normally do at work, that sort of a thing. Um, Self-care. What restores you? An important thing to think about. One of the things that can be helpful is to say, so what did I do when I lost someone 15 years ago? that was helpful for me. And maybe it was that I took up exercise. And in the years that have, have uh, passed between that first loss and this loss, I let it go for a while. Do I want to go back to the exercising? Again, you make sure that th your physician doesn't say, oh, you shouldn't be doing this if it's weightlifting and you have a bad back or something like that. So the exercise walking is something that most of us can do, but look at what restores you. If you gave up reading, go back to reading. Where that time can be something where you lose yourself in it. Has anyone heard of Louise Penny, the author who writes uh, crime novels in Canada? She lives in Quebec and she writes them. She's an exquisite author. She lost her husband, who was about 20 years older, to Alzheimer's disease. He had been a pediatric oncologist for many years. Anyway, she said that when her husband passed, one of the things that really helped her was in the afternoon, she'd sit down to write. And for a little while, she was engrossed in the lives of Armand, Gamash, I think is, is his name, the, the chief detective, and, and his wife, and uh, the people in this town where the, the murders occur. And she said being able to be immersed in that as she was writing and thinking about what would come next was something that was really healing for her. Um, so look at what restores you. Being careful with substances. You know, sometimes it's very easy. If we've done just a little bit of drinking in our lives, um, it's easy at a time of loss to start drinking a lot. And you know, because it helps. If you're really lonely or bored, it helps for a few hours. 
but it doesn't help for long. Alcohol is actually a depressant and it can impact our neurotransmitters that are involved to be, that are believed to be involved with depression. So serotonin and, and norepinephrine. So if a person drinks a lot, they may be causing a dysregulation of the serotonin and norepinephrine. So people need to be careful of substances. And as Marlette brought up earlier on, you know, if you, you've lost someone you've really loved recently, or you're working with people who have, it's really good to say, you know, why don't you see your family doc? And, and uh, just for a little bit of help there, and then is your doctor aware of the loss you have suffered? Even for basic blood pressure, things like that, he or she may talk to you if you need antidepressants for a short period of time. Connection. So Cathay Weingarten has done some really, some exquisite uh, work talking about um, thera work, um, therapy she's, she's done with ladies that have had challenging lives and may have lost some identity due to illness, this sort of thing. But she considers spirituality as being connection. We need to be connected to people. And you know, for me, this is a tough one because I'm an introvert. I don't find it easy to be amongst people. But I do know if I'm alone too much, it isn't a good thing. You know, it's easy to think the TV gives, I know this sounds bad, but it's easy to think you've had some sort of connection with people by the TV. But even if you're talking back to the TV, the, the TV's not talking to you. You really need to be amongst people. And if you find yourself socially isolating a lot, that's a sign that there's a problem there. Uh, Lessons in healing throughout the losses of your life, do your own internal work. And what we mean by that is do your own grieving. Do your own work in terms of who am I as a person? Who do I want to be? What steps do I need to take to become that person? And for some, it may be getting a degree. For others, it may be just dealing with anger issues or dealing with issues of unforgiveness or things like that. Do your own internal work. Spiritual need is accentuated in times of crisis. We can find ourselves lacking all that we need. This can motivate change. Sometimes a crisis of a loss of someone, it really can be a point of change where we say, you know what, I, I have some issues in my life and I need to deal with these. Uh, because if I deal with them now or in the months and years to come, I'm going to have more tools in my toolbox to deal with difficult situations down the road. Do you, do you want to say a word about post-traumatic growth? Yeah, so in the literature, obviously there's a lot about post-traumatic stress disorder or post-traumatic symptoms. Um, but there is some literature now on post-traumatic growth. So the notion of we can go through horrible life situations and we should never just paint a sunny picture of it. Obviously that's unrealistic. However, growth can come from it. Um, it can be because we channel our energies into um, a new career or we channel our energies into how can I remember my loved one? What can I do? Um, so, you know, when made, Mothers Against, sorry, MAD, Mothers Against Drunk Driving came about. There is quite a difference. Yes, there is. But, <laughs> but um, you know, uh, women were, were dealing with the loss of their children um, through a drunk driver. And so they formed the organization MAD. Um, and so it can be that kind of a thing. And then people can, in hindsight, look back and say, I would have never chosen this. And it still is probably going to be the saddest thing that ever happened to me. However, I can say that there has been some growth. Through the trauma, I'm a different person. And maybe in some ways that I wish weren't the case, 
I don't look at the world as so friendly anymore. But in other ways, I'm proud of who I've become. Last one. Oh. Okay, and self-awareness. Who am I? Interesting. I've heard it said that it's a useful thing for people to write their own obituary decades and decades before they pass. Because you write what you hope that someone will write about you when you're gone. And then you try and live up to that potential. Because for a lot of us, we live up to what our bosses want us to be, what family members want, to, want us to be, what we think society wants us to be. So people who really understand who they are and who are really comfortable in their skin, there's not many of them. Um, so, you know, to, to kind of think, who am I? What do I need? So in this time of grief, what do I need um, so that I can put my one foot in front of the other day after day? What do I believe about what has happened about myself in the loss? And so what do I believe about what has happened? That may be spiritual beliefs. It may be beliefs about the world. If I believed the world was basically fair, I may not believe that anymore about myself in this loss. So do I believe that even though I can't change the loss, and even though this is probably the worst thing that's ever happened to me, or one of the worst things, I can still choose how I'm going to go forward in my life. I still have some agency and some control. So there's, it's an interesting thing because we do not, we can't control all the time circumstances around us, but the adage we can control how we respond to it. And, and sometimes that's the only thing we can control. We're going to move on to emotional resiliency here and emotional agility. And I've struggled with do we show this clip or not, because um, it's a little bit longer, but I think it's really valuable. And so, Bri, can you cue us? And we'll talk about this, uh, Susan David, a psychologist, and her experience of grief and what she learned. So emotional rigidity is prescribed. You have to behave in this certain way, or you have to feel this and that. And she talks about emotional agility being really important in our resilience. And so there are some, a few quotes that are really uh, important. One more slide, Brian. Um, back to Susan David. She says, being positive has become a new form of moral correctness. But when we push aside normal emotions to embrace false positivity, we lose our capacity to develop skills to deal with the world as it is, not as we wish it to be. She lost her father, thank you. She lost her father to cancer. She was, oh, roughly junior high age. She gave her father a kiss goodbye. He was sick in a hospital bed in their front room. She said, uh, bye dad, with that beautiful South African accent. And she says, while she was doing maths, as they say, in uh, Britain and South Africa, her father was dying. And so she responded the only way she knew, which was to just work hard and keep her grades up, more of the same. And she said, everybody believed her act, that she was well, except a very intuitive English teacher who assigned everybody journals to write in. And this teacher brought out um, in her the whole grieving thing. And um, so she was allowed in her journals to say what she needed to say. And Susan David says, when we prescribe emotions for people in grief, we are doing them a great dis 
disservice. Can you picture us doing that in our society? Telling people how they should feel in their grief? We, we do it all the time, don't we? So the miscarriage, well, don't worry. Oh, we know you can get pregnant. You'll get pregnant again. Or um, you lost a job, well, whatever. Just pick another one up. You know, we, we negate people's loss and we want them to be positive, to put on a happy face. And I love this quote on the bottom. Life's beauty is inseparable from its fragility. Discomfort is the price of admission to a meaningful life. You know, um, I've always wanted a meaningful life, but I didn't realize it came through difficulty. And sometimes in my difficulty, I've shaken my fist at the heavens. But as I've gotten older, and Annette and I are pushing up on 60 here, um, I can see that a life that is uh, just one fun experience after another is not a meaningful life. And meaning comes from touching the fragile things in life. So Soren Kierkegaard, the Danish theologian and um, philosopher, said this, and I quite like this. Where am I? Who am I? How did I come to be here? What is this thing called the world? How did I come into the world? Why was I not consulted? And if I'm compelled to take part in it, where is the director? I want to see him. Haven't we felt like that? So when we have untidiness or we've got rawness, if we can be real about it, it certainly helps. Will my paradigm change? Sometimes. Will I change? Absolutely. By the way, I don't seek to change people's paradigm in their grief. Um, if people are, are seeking something, I try to help them with that. Um, many people experience a spiritual renewal as they're getting close to death. But where I will challenge a paradigm is when the belief system is very damning. Bad word intended. So um, my lady who lost her baby to SIDS and shook like this, part of the reason why she shook, it, shook is she believed that she was under the judgment of God for an abortion she had had earlier in her life. I had to challenge that. She had spent time in a psych ward she, um, because she was suicidal. When she came to me, she only wanted a pastor. She didn't want a psychiatrist, a psychologist, whatever. And I actually said to her, I won't see you unless you keep your psychiatrist or your psychologist, unless, unless you keep getting the medical attention that you need, but I would help her spiritually and I would um, address that area that would really cause her a lot of harm. C.S. Lewis said, we were promised sufferings. They were part of the program. We were even told, blessed are they that mourn, and I accept it. I've got nothing that I hadn't bargained for. Of course, it is different when the thing happens to oneself, not to others, and in reality, not in imagination. And this is you. Yep. So one of the things, lessons in healing for ourselves or for when we work with others, the importance to listen to trusted others in our lives. We all need trusted others. And so in other words, it's not that we have to pour our grief or our life circumstances out to everyone you know, who sits on the bus beside us um, when we're at Tim's getting a cup of coffee and the person behind the counter, we don't pour out our, our, our problems to all of them, but to some trusted others, we need that. It's how we were wired, how we were built. 
Seek help where needed, professional help if necessary. Um, with my diagnosis, and we didn't know, I had been told I had a 50-50 chance of making it five years, um, I sought help and still do occasionally because how do you plan for a life like that? When I was told, don't plan, where's the future when I'm told there isn't much of a future, at least not on this earth, what do you do? And so seeking professional help has been helpful. Um, so the piglet sided up, up to Pooh from behind. Pooh, he whispered, yes, piglet. Nothing, said piglet, taking uh, Pooh's arm, or paw, pardon me. I just wanted to be sure of you. So despite the fact that I but butchered that quote because I couldn't read the writing on the screen, it's really a beautiful example of holding space, a concept that is used when we work with people, that we just be with people. We don't have to have all the answers, and matter of fact, we better not have all the answers because we don't have them. And maybe that's one of the graces of getting older is, is we recognize how few answers we have. But sometimes the biggest answer is, is our ability to really be present with people and to listen and to affirm them, to normalize and say, I don't know how you've gotten through this up to this point in time. I sure respect you for it, but it must be difficult. And anything I can do to help, I, I sure would be honored. But to really, really listen is huge. Uh, when does one know that professional help is needed? Where there's been no progress in mourning? So um, sometimes an indication is, is someone like a widow who continues to go to the grave every day, even though she's engaged to another man. And then you say, okay, here, there, there's, there's a problem here. And it's not that she shouldn't grieve the death of her husband, but it's been quite a long period of time. She's marrying someone else, but she still has to go to the graveside every day. When one cannot, after a time of grief, begin to assume responsibilities for tasks of daily living. You know, we often talk about that in mental health. It's really important. Can we do the daily tasks of living? Whether it's work-related, whether it's just the day-to-day -day stuff, and if we still cannot do that, then it's a good indicator that there's a problem. It's not a moral issue, but it's a good indicator that we're having trouble with the grief and that the grief may actually be a full-blown depression, a clinical depression that needs treatment. When one has thoughts or plans of self-harm, um, huge issue if, if people are getting to the point where they're suicidal um, that's a red flag immediately that help is needed. Or in situations of substance abuse where the person continues to abuse substances, you know, they say, well, it's 11 in the morning, but I'm sure it's 6 in the evening somewhere in this world. And so they start drinking and they drink their days through, day after day after day. And it turns into month after month and it could be year after year, and that's a really good indication that they can't move on. I'm just gonna jump in here. If you want a terrific resource uh, for seniors, it's called SAIL, and it's an acronym for Substance Abuse in Later Life. And if you, um, you can look it up, it's, it's a program run through AHS, and it is helpful for folks who have substance abu abuse issues um, who, are, who are seniors, and it's a super resource. And I should say, part of the problem as we get older is, is that our livers do not metabolize medications or substances as well, and our kidneys don't excrete them as well. So sometimes what can happen is, is that an older adult starts to use a substance in a way that he or she used decades earlier. 
and decades earlier, they were okay. Their body managed it. But now, in their 60s or 70s, they can't. And they can actually end up unintentionally killing themselves by using substances in a way that was okay at 30, but it isn't okay at 70. Can, can you mention a new emerging subpopulation that are showing up in emergency wards? Yeah, I read an article about um, a very tiny portion of older adults that still use heroin. And they used heroin in the 60s when they were young. And you know, they were fine. But of course, if you consider physiology, their livers don't metabolize the heroin as well, so it floats in the bloodstream longer. Their kidneys don't excrete it as well. They're showing up and emerge, and some are dying from it because it was okay when they were 20 something in the 60s, but it isn't okay now. And so, you know, it's just, it's just a word to the wise. One time I, um, in teaching, I taught at U of C for many years face-to-face. -face. And in my class, I talked about people who use combined substances, um, drugs, and particularly benzodiazepines with, say, alcohol. And uh, it can put them into respiratory depression and they can die. And this lovely lady in her 30s came up to me after class and she said, Annette, thank you so much for saying that. She said, that's what happened to my mom. She was in her 50s and she combined benzodiazepines, you know, that are given for extreme anxiety, combined with alcohol and she passed away. And it was not an intentional suicide, but it was a miscalculation of substances. So the need to be very careful there. And so further lessons in caring, know that you cannot fix it. And you know what, it's a terrible thing. It's a terrible thing when we can't fix things. At 32 years ago, Marlette was diagnosed um, with severe rheumatoid arthritis. And um, through these 32 years, I could listen. And I think I did a decent job of that, but I couldn't fix it. And you know, it's a terrible thing when you see someone you love suffer a lot of pain and you can't fix it. Sadly, you know, the older we get, all of us will have that. And so we need to let ourselves off the hook and say, my job isn't to fix it. My job is to listen and to support. We don't, we don't fix it. Do your own spiritual or existential work. So in a colloquial or sort of everyday understanding of existential, it's issues related to meaning and purpose in life. So do your own work around um, what gives me meaning in my, my life and purpose. And what do I need in order to do more of these activities that give me meaning and purpose in life? And part of existential issues is what do you believe about life and death? Um, big thing, no matter what your paradigm is, you need to look at what do you believe about the biggies, both life and death. Have you grieved your own losses? Um, some have, some have not, and I know it's a very difficult thing. When you don't have the answers, what then? And that gets back to um, the why around a death, but also who do you need to seek if you feel that you don't have answers that are good enough for you in terms of life and death. You know, do your own searching. Life is so very frail, I want to touch the fragile things interesting that some of the most beautiful things are flowers and flowers are so frail um, we don't have flowers in my house because i'll kill them but it's out of kindness because i think oh dear looks thirsty you know the soil looks dry 
and so I give them too much water, nothing survives in it when it comes to plants. They're so fragile, but their beauty is undeniable. Hold space. I talked about that, to just sit with people. Do I have time for a quick story? I, I remember reading about something, and I think it was in a Reader's Digest, about a woman whose daughter had an illness, and it got to, it was cancer, and it got to be terminal, and she hadn't passed yet. Um, but when this woman got the news, her friend came over, and um, the friend saw that the woman was just cleaning the floor, cleaning the floor on her hands and, and knees, cleaning the floor, and so she got on the floor and started cleaning the floor. And the woman said, I don't know how I'm ever going to get through this. I, I don't know how I can. And as the woman cleaned her friend, she said, I don't know either how you're going to get through this. And the woman said at that very moment, she didn't know how she would get through it, but she knew she would. She knew she would because someone understood her and was avoiding the platitudes. That's the worst thing you can do. I hate platitudes, and platitudes very often are for the benefit of the person who said it, not for the benefit of the person who unfortunately gets assaulted by the platitude. Because if someone says, um, you know, gives a, a spiritual platitude, really what they're saying is, shut up, I don't want to hear you. I, you know, like, this is too uncomfortable for me. You know, don't, don't pee on my cornflakes. I don't want to hear about this. And that's what they're saying. And so avoid platitudes. Bear witness to their strengths and challenges. Timing is everything. So you don't want to say, well, you know, you'll get through it because you're so strong. You know, you've gotten through this, this, this. You don't want to do that. But you can bear witness to their challenges. I don't know how you're going to get through this. This is very difficult. And you know, what do you need from people around you? But as you talk, and you talk further, and you talk further, then you can bring up their strengths and say, you know, um, a thought just occurred to me, you know, about how much you've been through. And that doesn't mean this is going to be easy. If anything, this is going to be tougher because you have been through so much but you're the strongest person I've ever known. That can be very helpful. If it's given in timing, correct timing, it's given in sincerity, and it's also given tentatively or, or assuredly, yet at the same time not to say, now you just need to be quiet and don't give your doubts to me or don't give your fears. And is practical help needed? That can be very helpful. I've known of people that are really bad at sitting with people who are sick or sitting with people who are dying. But you know what? They're pretty good at making meals for the family. And they'll do that. It, and, and I've had people say, if I've had a treatment, you know, I want to, to make a meal. And I've said, well, thank you, but I don't need it because Dave does the cooking in our house. He, he's our chef and he's very good. I'm not good, not even remotely good. So I've said Dave does the cooking and I've had people say, I need to do it for me, Annette, please. And then I say, okay, thanks. Now, of course, it's easier when they're a good cook. When they're really not a good cook, <laughs> then that's a little more of a challenge. I just had a knee replaced um, at the beginning of the fall. And uh, I received the dregs of a church casserole bank. And, uh, and one of them, the, the uh, tin foil had actually disintegrated into the meal. So we ended up throwing all of it away. But uh, not everything that you're given is created equal, for sure. We're Brene Brown. Okay, we're going to try Brene, and she 
um, says some, some really good things. She is distinguishing between empathy and sympathy here. <gasps> So what is empathy, and why is it very different than sympathy? Empathy fuels connection. Sympathy drives disconnection. Empathy, it's very interesting. Teresa Wiseman is a nursing scholar who studied professions, very diverse professions, where empathy is relevant, and came up with four qualities of empathy. Perspective taking, the ability to take the perspective of another person or, or recognize their perspective as their truth. Staying out of judgment, not easy when you enjoy it as much as most of us do. <laughs> Recognizing emotion in other people and then communicating that. Empathy is feeling with people. And to me, I always think of empathy as this kind of sacred space when someone's kind of in a deep hole and they shout out from the bottom and they say, I'm stuck, it's dark, I'm overwhelmed. And then we look and we say, hey, and climb down. I know what it's like down here, and you're not alone. Sympathy is, ooh, <laughs> it's bad, uh-huh. <laughs> uh, no, you want a sandwich? <laughs> um, empathy is a choice, and it's a vulnerable choice, because in order to connect with you, I have to connect with something in myself that knows that feeling. Rarely, if ever, does an empathic response begin with at least. I had a, yeah. And we do it all the time. Because you know what? Someone just shared something with us that's incredibly painful, and we're trying to silver lining it. I don't think that's a verb, but I'm using it as one. We're trying to put the silver lining around it. So I had a miscarriage. Oh, at least you know you can get pregnant. I think my marriage is falling apart. At least you have a marriage. <laughs> John's getting kicked out of school. At least Sarah is an A student. But one of the things we do sometimes in the face of very difficult conversations is we try to make things better. If I share something with you that's very difficult, I'd rather you say, I don't even know what to say right now. I'm just so glad you told me. Because the truth is, rarely can a response make something better. What makes something better is connection. So if we can move down almost to the end, Bri. Uh, there we go, a few closing quotes. You can't rush grief. It has its own timetable. All you can do is make sure there are lots of soft places around beds, pillows, arms, and laps. And Lamotte says, you will lose someone you can't live without and your heart will be badly broken. And the bad news is that you will never completely get over the loss of your beloved but this is also the good news. They live forever in your broken heart that doesn't seal back up, and you come through. It's like having a broken leg that never heals perfectly, that still hurts when the weather gets cold, but you learn to dance with a limp. Deep grief sometimes is almost like a specific location, a coordinate on a map of time. When you are standing in that forest of sorrow, you cannot imagine that you could ever find your way to a better place. But if someone can assure you that they themselves have stood in that same place and now have moved on, sometimes this will bring hope. And to finish off, the reality is, is that you will grieve forever. Fascinating comment. You will not get over the loss of a loved one. You will learn to live with it or as that colleague of mine talked about, walking beside something. You will heal and you will rebuild yourself around the loss you have suffered. You will be whole again, but you will never be the same. Nor should you be the same, nor would you want to. It's one more, yep. Uh, Ziggy, Marlette and I love Ziggy, was big when we were younger. 
and uh, always kind of an existentialist. Tolstoy, quote, only people who are capable of loving strongly can also suffer great sorrow. But the same necessity of loving serves to counteract their grief and heals them. Thank you, folks. You've been great. Thank you very much. Well, thank you guys for sharing. That was amazing. So many good tools and resources to help. Um, yeah, with this is a hard topic, I think, to talk about, but this has been very, very practical. And if you guys have any questions, uh, maybe we can put your, I'll send a follow-up email with the videos, is that, if that's okay with you guys. We could send those out with the notes. Uh, also with the, yeah, if you guys have any questions, we'll send out the emails. Just a reminder, the books are at the back if you guys would like to purchase those on the way out. Um, yeah, does anyone have any final questions before we have, do you guys have a bit of time? Maybe one or two? question was, how do you know if you've dealt with grief? You, it's a fantastic one. You often don't know um, until something comes along that might trigger that. So, um, for instance, if uh, it's easier to tell when you haven't dealt with grief. So, for instance, there's something that happens and immediately you are brought back to another loss in your life that feels like it just happened yesterday. And you know then, okay, um, there's something here that I haven't dealt with. And you can explore that with somebody who can ask you questions, etc. I think it's okay to assume that you've, you've done okay with your grief. And until, it, until you get information otherwise. So if you are having somatic complaints, stomach aches, headaches, etc., um, and uh, they came about in your life when there was a significant loss, but they still remain, that is probably a clue that you haven't dealt with something. But if you don't have any kind of somatic complaints, you don't, you're not having nightmares, you are able to function really well, then, um, then likely you have dealt with it as much as you can. And you know, they say that grief is like an onion and the outer layer comes off, but it's not necessarily the time to, you know, pull back every layer just to say, okay, let's get through this and, you know, pull back all the layers. There are times in our lives where we may look at something differently. We may, um, we may grieve something in a different way, you know, et cetera. And it isn't that you haven't done your work necessarily before that time. It's just that now you are doing um, work that is appropriate to this time and these circumstances. So it's a really good question and nobody has ever asked me that question before. Thank you. I actually had one around during this COVID time. Um, there's been cases I've heard, like I'm currently a, a counseling student. And so even I've heard this from people my age or a little bit older with, you know, even with COVID of, I've heard of one story of somebody accidentally giving COVID to their grandparents and they're dealing with almost like this guilt mixed with grief. Uh, so it's not just for young people, but it could be any age. Can you guys address that in this current pandemic we're facing? It's a terrible time to be bereaved right now. Um, uh, the governor of New York, whose name I forget, but at one point when they had coffins stacked up on top of each other in hockey arenas in New York because they had so many people passing from COVID, he said, how are we ever going to grieve these losses? You know, um, a lot now you're seeing in the paper. We will celebrate uh, so-and-so's life, um, you know, when the current pandemic situation is over with. Is it likely going to happen? Probably not. And so um, COVID is a particularly difficult time and people are feeling guilty, they're feeling anxious, they're feeling angry over a whole lot of things. I don't know if anybody reads obituaries like I do, but if I open the paper, and it, it's a part of having done hospice work and Tina is nodding her head, um, almost every day you see a suicide in there because people are really struggling to cope with it. 
So um, even the dollars that the government is putting into churches to offer resources like tonight is really significant. And the fact that even though we're masked or large, largely masked, um, and I not right now, but being together is a good thing. Um, I've done more than one session on Zoom thus far in the pandemic, and I tell you, you miss the, the dynamic, the connection, et cetera. So um, it is a very, very difficult time in our society and in the world um, because of the restrictions that we have. And just to pick up a couple of threads with the example you gave, Josh, I would say that number one, this individual needs to probably, if he or she is still feeling a lot of guilt around um, having had COVID and unwittingly given that to, to his or her grandparents, probably could use um, a little bit of online counseling if that's what's available um, to, to kind of work through it that it doesn't weigh too heavily on he or she. The other thing Marlette was talking about with the, you know, a service will be available when, um, when COVID restrictions are lifted. I think, number one, there needs to be a service done on Zoom or at least a family service around the grave to begin with, and then a bigger service later. Marlette has actually done memorial services for someone who died three years ago, and that was before COVID, but family members honored the wishes of the person who did not want a memorial service. And then what happened was, is the family couldn't go on. And, and uh, Marlette was approached and they said, please, we just cannot move on with our lives until this person has been, has been um, you know, celebrated, that sort of a thing. And so, Memorial services are for the living. They're to honor the dead, but they're for the living. And we need as much as possible, even in variations, to keep them going because it's so much a part of how we um, sort of shut, put a, uh, not a full door, but a gate closed on one part of our lives and then still move forward, but it's a gate rather than a full door so we could still look back over at the, at the person. Maybe not a good analogy, but I'm just thinking through it right now. Awesome. Well, thank you guys again for your time and thank you guys for taking the time out to yeah, come out. And it will be posted online this session as well. Uh, we'll post it up on the Hub website. Um, yeah, if you guys have any other further questions, I'm sure they'll stick around for a few more minutes or you can email and yeah, with that, I'm just going to invite Craig up. He has a couple announcements. Craig's our care pastor on staff here at the church. Uh, we, the church has resources for those that are involved in the church and for the community. Um, with that, why don't we just give one final hand to these guys for their time?